A number of you, probably those on this side of the sanctuary, have seen this this morning and wondering what on earth is this track hurdle doing here at church? Now, I know there's some people in here that are very familiar with track and field. Maybe that's indoors. Maybe that's outdoors. Maybe you did it in high school. Maybe some in college. But some of you have jumped over pylons like this, while others, like me, have watched you do some crazy things when you hit them. I thought about having a volunteer to come forward and kind of display what it means to, to jump a, a hurdle. And then I thought to myself really quickly, I am a part of the Boom Boys that meet on Wednesday, and I know I'd have a couple of them run up here, and they would race across the stage for you, and they would probably run into every instrument up here, and then we'd have to deal with Drew. So I'm going to invite Pastor Sean to come forward and demonstrate. <laughs> Of course, I'm only kidding. But a hurdle in a track event, they're in a lane. The whole intention of this is to have the runner, he or she, stay in their lane and have their stride meet without slowing down and have their feet go over and the other following foot come over the hurdle without slowing down. One thing I can guarantee you, this I have never been good at this. It's probably been 25 years since I've tried. So I don't know what it means to be a good hurdler on, on the track. In fact, I'm the exact opposite. I, I remember very clearly my senior year in high school trying to, trying to do the hurdle. I could run, but I couldn't run and jump at the same time. Kind of like a, a baby giraffe on ice is pop probably what I look like. But I do know the pain of when your shin smacks the back of that when you're trying to jump it. Has anybody ever smashed their shin on a hurdle before? It hurts. And almost most certainly when you hit that hurdle, when you are flying as fast as you can and you, you hit this hurdle, your lead foot is over and your back leg hits this, you are going to do one thing and that is crash really hard right there. Ever, anybody ever done that before? Nobody here ran track? So everybody in this sanctuary is one of those people that frown at those that run down the highway, down the road, or ride bikes? We just watch, right? Okay. You hit this, and you hit the ground hard. You're going to have bruises on your elbows. You're going to have bruises on your knees. You're going to be embarrassed because everybody else on the team saw you do that. And one of two things are going to happen. You're going to get up with a bloody limb and walk to the side, or you're going to get back up and keep running your lane, knowing that another hurdle is only three steps away. Now, in a spiritual world, hurdles are not most of the time in the lane that we are running down. In fact, in a spiritual world, these hurdles, they, they come around the corner when, when we don't and, and we cannot see what's on the opposite side. And they hurt. Sometimes they completely blindside us where, where life is good, where we're walking with Jesus, where we're, we're loving our kids and our wives and our family is great, and then something blindsides us in life from the side. We did not see it coming, and we hit our shins, our spiritual shins. We hit our heart, and we crash, and we fall. Today, what we're going to be looking at is a Two verses. If you've been a part of the church for some time, you know that these verses are, are in the Bible. You, you know that they're a pretty ugly testimony to, to mankind. But we're going to be looking at what one man did. And we're going to lay that in the lap of every one of us this morning before we leave here. So I trust that you have found Mark chapter 14. I want to encourage you to please rise where you are. We're going to pray and then read this together. 
Mark chapter 14, let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is in our hands. And without question, because your word says to be clear that this is the only truth this world has ever known. And Father, in a world where that statement alone causes tension, Lord, we find comfort in it. Knowing that we don't need to make anything up. But your word is your word. So Father, as we read this, open our eyes, open our ears, and soften our hearts. Help us, help us, help each one of us become more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Please remain standing. Verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. Verse 11. And when they had heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. And you may be seated. I wanted to take a quick moment and go into a little bit of a, a more detailed account of, of, of who Judas is a part of, right? We know that Judas is one of the twelve, and I need to remind some of us of what his place was with Jesus. If you're taking notes, first thing that I want you to, to write down in your, your sermon notes is this group of twelve is the, the foundation of the church. Even Judas, the foundation of, of the church. Who were these 12? You find them in Mark chapter 3. I want to read this to you a second. And they went up to the mountain and called to him who, those who he desired. And they came to him, and he appointed 12 whom he named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Let's pause there for a second. Before we read the 12 names, what was the purpose of every 12, all 12 members of this team? It is to heal and it is to preach. Members who are the founding fathers of the church, members here at Fellowship Church, you are a part of the foundation of this church. Your responsibility is the exact same as these 12. Let's continue as we go on verse 16. He pointed the twelve, Simon, who he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, the sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and of course, rounding out the twelve, as always, Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. These were the, the 12 men that Jesus appointed to be his disciples. And I want to look at three of these individuals, okay? We want to look at Peter, okay? If you know your Old Testament, you know that he is referenced as the rock. He is a strong man. He is a passionate man. He is consistently putting his foot in his mouth throughout all of the epistles and most of the New Testament. But let's look at the term sons of thunder for a second. James and John. James and John, they're brothers. If we know our, Old Test our New Testament, we know that, that James happens, excuse me, that John happens to be the disciple that, that Jesus loved. In fact, he was his closest friend. And he would draw testimony to that throughout the last year of his ministry but has the same characteristic as Peter and the same characteristic as his brother James. What is that? If you have a study Bible, I want to encourage you to, to pick one up. There's several different flavors of it, but what we use here is a John MacArthur ESV study Bible. If you have one in your lap, I want to encourage you to, to read this with me. They were named the, the sons of thunder for this reason and this reason only, because of their intense, outspoken personalities. Okay, we all know people with intense, outspoken personalities, do we not? 
Some of us live with them. Some of us sleep with them. Some of us are being raised by those individuals with intense personalities. But as we're looking at this text and, and looking at it through a couple of different lenses, I want to pause and just invite a question into this conversation. Because for most of us, we can read this story about Judas and we can say, nah, there's no way I would ever do something as low as that man did. One more question. I wonder, I wonder what the decision of Judas did to those who are watching from the outside. Perhaps those that were following on the mountain, those that were standing around when Jesus is selecting these 12, and maybe individuals were this close to saying yes for the very first time that I do believe that he is indeed the Son of God. And then find out about one of the 12 stepping back and saying, no, blood money is way more important to me. I, I, I wonder if I even want the answer to this question. But if I was to ask God and he was to give me an answer, how many times have I been a hindrance to an individual who doesn't know Jesus, who's maybe on the outside looking in? Maybe we even within the church. I wonder. I know I don't want to know the answer to that. But I know that I have a very intense personality, as many of you do. I wonder how I would respond if I was James, if I was Peter, if I was John. When one of the guys that were on my team, who I've been living with for the last three plus years, has came out and said that he is no longer, no, no, not longer, he has never been aligned with Jesus because Jesus is Messiah. You see, when you have an intense personality like James and, and John and many of you, when we come across a hurdle like that, what are we going to do? It is so easy for us to, to look at that individual and write them off. And if we're going to be so bold, maybe even say, go get me the rope. I'll finish this off myself. Because we're hurt. It's not a, a shin or an elbow hurt. It's a, a hearts are hurt. Our hearts are broken because of somebody's decision to walk away from the faith of Jesus Christ. We're hurt. And I'm going to speak directly into those individuals that have an intense personality this morning. It is never your job. It is never my job. To condemn those that have fallen to a hurdle. It's never your job, dads, to condemn your sons for doing something so brain dead that you've told them 500 times not to do, but they did it anyway. It is completely your job, daughters and sons of thunder, and you know who you are. It's to be the disciple that God has called you to be, to heal them and to speak truth into them and help them up. That's the foundation of the church. And friends, so many of us here today, our lives would be so much stronger. Our relationships would be so much deeper and richer if we would forgive the people that have hurt us in our hearts. So the question I don't know what the answer to for myself, I'm going to present to you this morning. 
Do you want to know how you were a hindrance or a hurdle to someone else knowing who Jesus Christ is? You see, God's plan will never be hindered by man's will or, or intention. I don't want to beat Judas up at all because he was a part of God's number one plan. He was a part of God's plan of salvation. If you want to, if you want to pull out your study Bible again, if you don't have one, can you please just read at, at this verse that I want to share with you? It's coming from 1410. For it is clear that Judas never had any spiritual interest in Jesus. He was attracted to him because he expected Jesus to become a powerful religious and political leader. He saw great potential for power and wealth and prestige through his association with Jesus. That is why, for three years, Judas walked alongside in the shadows, in the dust of Jesus. So what Judas wanted... He never obtained. What Judas was not aware of never was able to happen. Judas did not believe him as a Messiah. I want to look at that for a moment. Because I, the older I get, the more I have to evaluate my own self over and over and again where in the world is my heart, especially as I lead three young hearts into a generation that's likely farther away from Jesus than it is today. What are my desires in this world? If we were to unpack power, prestige, and wealth, we could translate it to this. We want comfy, we want cozy, we want clean, and we want AC, even if it's a, a degree hotter than we prefer it to be. We help out. We pray, yes. But we want our lives to be what we want our lives to be. We want to be comfortable. I think Judas' example of that is inseparable from the hearts and the desires of most people in the Western world. And even in the church and even behind the pulpit sometimes. I wonder if that is a hurdle that maybe, maybe I need help overcoming. Maybe you need help overcoming the hurdle of prestige and power, of money, of comfort. See, it's safe there. It's safe when we build our little sanctuaries. It's safe when we can isolate ourselves from the uglinesses of the world. But I wonder, I think it's clearer in the text. Now that's exactly what Judas wanted. He wanted to be only with the people that he thought made all the decisions. I was thinking to myself today, as like behind the, this week, behind the pulpit, like I could probably list a hundred different occupations that I would rather do than be a preacher. If God was in my heart and telling me every single day, Brent, buck your flesh and do what I ask you to do, I would probably trade half of you for your occupation for what I get to do today. 
Because the call that God has put on every single one of us who are followers of Jesus Christ is the exact same as what I'm doing right now. And I wonder, how are we doing with that? How are we healing those that are tripped up because of the hurdles? How are we doing with encouraging those that have been beat up and and knocked to the ground? How are we doing with sharing the gospel, the only truth this world has ever known? How in the world are we doing with that today? You see, the third thing I want to point out this morning is that the gospel always has what I'm going to call this morning as an annoying neighbor, okay? I want to call it that because that is exactly what it is. When we have the gospel within our heart, there is this thing that is always pressuring us saying, hey, silence this. Be careful on how much you share. Don't tell them exactly what church you go to because of the the stance that we believe on the foundation that 2 Timothy 3.16 is accurate. There's so many things that you could talk about. Who won the ball game last night? Who got the biggest buck? What vacation are you planning on this, this coming spring break? The gospel has, always has an annoying neighbor. And, and you know those annoying neighbors, they followed Jesus around for a long time. Right? They stoned him. They chased him out of the temple. They tested him in the wilderness for a month, waiting for an opportunity for him to trip up. And Judas walks right into that trap, and sure enough, they are going to take advantage of that. What does that annoying neighbor look like in your world? I wonder. I want to land on this, guys. What does it cost to follow Jesus? Let's look at it through the lens of, of Judas, for example. Okay, he was he was banking, he was investing in in his future, walking through Jesus. No question about it. He wanted everything that that money and power and wealth could offer. That's what he was living for. He was packing that four hundred one k. Maxing out his wrath, investing in what Jesus could probably get him. In the world we live in today, there's no money in following Jesus. For an individual that is pursuing prestige and, and power by the name of Jesus is probably someone who does not belong in the pulpit, let alone the leadership team. But the question still remains, what what does it cost us to follow Jesus? What are the first things that we think of? Some of us, we think of of money. Brian came up before you just a few moments ago and said, thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity. Those on the outside of the faith would say that, oh, you got to pay to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And absolutely not. That's not the case. That is not why you gave, whether you gave a penny or whether you gave $5,000 towards that band. That is not why you did that. You know that. But the outside world might look at it differently. What about prestige? Do you want to be recognized within a faith community? Do you want more business for yourself? Rubbing shoulders with people that might need your services? Time is a big one. We all have the same amount of it. How much time does it cost? Being one of your pastors, I know one thing is for sure is I don't have time in my life not to serve because I know what he's done for me. 
And I've been able to do life with a number of you over the last four and a half years, and I know what he's done in your life too. And I don't know if you have enough time to say thank you enough for what he's done for your marriage, your family, your career, your faith. I want to read one verse to you here. I think I've shared it with you at least a half a dozen times. It happens to be my life verse and probably the verse that keeps me on track when I know I've fallen off the wagon a little bit. Matthew 16, 24, 27. Jesus says this to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. For if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? See, friends, these notes, that that note from Jesus is a little too late for, for Judas. He is spending eternity completely apart from the Messiah. But friends, I want to encourage every single one of you today, whether you are in the faith today, take another step of faith. Maybe it's forgiving somebody. Maybe it's helping somebody up. Maybe for you, it is meeting with the elders. Maybe not even waiting that long. Maybe after the service this morning. And so you want to commit your life to Jesus Christ. Because he has forgiven us. The moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the moment we do, we are his sons and his daughters. What an awesome, awesome promise. I want to leave you with this. I was reminded of it uh, this past week. A simple prayer that was written, I don't know, probably 15 years ago, and it's taped to the inside cover of my Bible. Will you pray this with me? Please bow your heads. Jesus, give us a, a humble heart. Teach us to have a meek attitude. And take from us our selfish pride. Fill our soul with an eternal gratitude and disrobe us from our self-importances. Strip our conceit and our arrogance remove the smudges on our face, rip away any self-imposed relevance, clothe us in your righteousness, wrap us in your truth and in your love and cover us with your Holy Spirit, bind us to you up above. Jesus, give us a holy humbleness, dispose of any remaining selfish debris and take from us our our self-centeredness, And let humility bend our prideful knee. Amen.